Hello, everyone, and happy Sunday. Welcome to Fair Voice. I'm Hannah Sirak, your host, and Fair Voice is the podcast on Fair Latter day Saints. Yes, you might have noticed our URL has changed from Fair Mormon to FairLatterdaySaints.org. That's because our prophet, President Nelson, very lovely human being, very lovely prophet, asked us to emphasize the name of the church. So, Fair has been working on this for a while. Um, The URL is now different. Um, So I hope you enjoyed that. It it throws me off still, but I'm very excited. I'm excited to be with you here today. I'm excited to talk to Brent Top about Come Follow Me. So this should be a very fantastic episode. But first off, we have our Q&A. There are a lot of questions that are backlogged. We'll get to them. I promise you. I'll prepare some answers. It'll be fantastic. But always remember, if you have a question that you would like me to answer, please email h-s-e-a-r-i-a-c at fairmormon.org. Yeah, my my email still is at fairmormon.org, so please do that. I don't know how email works. I don't know if that'll change, so make sure to email them to me. We got some great questions. I'll answer them very soon. But today's question is one of my favorite questions that I could have gotten asked, and it was, Hannah, you know, tell me your favorite Latter-day Saint prophet. This is a hard question in a lot of ways, but it's also a very easy question. Um, I am a very basic human being, and my favorite prophet is probably Joseph Smith. Um, I do love all of the prophets. There's not a single prophet that I don't love. Uh, I admire a lot of different things about prophets. I always like to say about Brigham Young that I admire his creative energy. I admire his passion and his verve. You know, I think Adam God theory, though while it is incorrect and has been called a false doctrine, I think it shows that Brigham Young was a creative thinker. So those are the kinds of things that I look for in prophets. I think President Nelson is one of the happiest people you'll ever meet in your entire life. The man looks like sunshine constantly, and I just admire that so much. Wilford Woodruff, super duper faithful, up into the end, stalwart person. But let's talk for a minute about Joseph Smith. Why do I like Joseph Smith? There, There's a lot of reasons, to be honest with you. I really like Joseph Smith's approach to theology. I like the way that he, you know, answered questions. Um, I liked the way that he received revelations. Honestly, I, I, there's nothing I, I dislike about Joseph Smith's theology. It's all, it's all amazing to me. It's all very inspired. But probably my favorite thing about Joseph Smith is his character and his personality. I think that we see from a very early age, Joseph Smith is very concerned with other people. We see this when he tries to help his father when he's very young. He tries to show his father that he can overcome not needing alcohol um, in order to get through a very painful surgery. And his dad was likely an alcoholic at the time. Um, We see that towards the end of his life at Liberty Jail that Joseph Smith became even more cheerful after he had this really harrowing experience and the Lord spoke to him and the Lord said, Hey Joseph, just letting you know, like you could have hell come against you, but it'll all work together for your good. And the son of man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? I I just love that about Joseph Smith. I love how stalwart he was. I love how faithful, compassionate and loving he was. And I just love his cheerful disposition. The people who knew Joseph Smith best believed him most. And I think that that's incredible. I think that that's a really amazing character trait um, that Joseph Smith had of being a very faithful person. So Joseph Smith is my favorite Latter-day Saint prophet. Should be shocking to absolutely no one who has ever listened to this podcast because, you know, I love Joseph Smith. So that's it. Uh, Let's get into announcements. So, you know, this podcast is going great. We have some great episodes planned. Trust me, some really interesting content coming up soon. I'm very excited about it. But please let me know if you want me to do any topic on for the podcast. If you have any suggestions, you can make suggestions. That is totally permissible. Um, we have some great content. I'm planning for the summer's content because I have most of spring's content planned. I know I was actually ahead this time. So I'm very excited. I can't wait to keep going with this. But today we're going to talk about Come Follow Me. So this is an interesting episode. It's with Brent Top. Brent Top will introduce himself but he's over in BYU Religious Education. Very amazing professor. Very amazing person. I, I know Professor Top 
pretty well, I would say. And this was a very fun interview for me for a lot of reasons. We talk about Come Follow Me as a program. And then we also talk about this week's Come Follow Me. So it should be a nice little break from, you know, what we've been talking about recently, which is definitely some heavy stuff, some stuff that makes me tired. I will say every podcast I record, I get very tired. But this one, I was I was slightly less tired than usual. So let's just dive right into it today. Today I'm with Brent Top, and I would like him to introduce himself. Um, thanks for coming on today. Could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I am a professor of uh, church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University in, in the College of Religious Education. Uh, I am completing my 34th year at BYU. Uh, I think I am the not the oldest, but the longest serving member of our faculty. And, uh, and so I really am a dinosaur, maybe the dinosaur that's about ready to become petroleum. So, uh, but uh, I've been here at BYU 34 years. I was with the seminaries and institutes um, as an institute instructor, seminary teacher and administrator for 11 years uh, prior to coming to BYU. And so this completes my 45th year as a religious educator. That's a really long time. That's a really great career, though. You've got a yeah, lot of Well, I started when I was negative six, and I'm, I am now uh, 39 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. No, and wife, I, I told my students yesterday, I'm an old geezer, so they have to, <laughs> they have to go easy on this old OK boomer. <laughs> Awesome. Yep. I'll go easy on you. Don't worry, Brother Top. Thank you. If you don't, I'll go back and change your grade from when you were in my class. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Today we're going to talk a little bit about families and come follow me. Uh, Brother Top has some really great insights on families. That's part of what he has studied. And there are a lot of problems with families right now. So I'd like to hear from you, Brother Top, on why do you think families are struggling to stay together right now? Well, I think I think families always struggle because we live in, in a fallen world. I jokingly say, uh, and, and only half joking, that uh, every family is dysfunctional because we are fallen creatures. There are no such thing as, as perfect model Latter-day Saint families or any other kinds of families. Uh, every, every family has their share of challenges. But I think there's a couple of things. Uh, uh, the secularization of society is, is taking its toll in many ways on families. Uh, just the, the crazy schedules that uh, parents have and children have and trying to be involved in activities and trying to do everything they need to do to get into good schools and all of that type of stuff. So there's time challenges uh, there are secular challenges that uh, encountering with uh, peers and friends and uh, institutions that are not as sympathetic to faith. And that, uh, that starts to wear on you a little bit. Uh, but I think the last year with the, the pandemic has had a, an, a really hard, hard toll on families. I know in our own family, we have seen um, some really negative side effects uh, from the COVID pandemic because my, my children then become the teachers at home holding down jobs, uh, trying to provide spiritual, educational, social, every kind of supervision and environment and, and the kids have not been able to be around friends. Uh, it increases tensions and stress all the way around. I felt so sorry for, for my daughter uh, trying during this period of time. And, uh, and then I, I, my son and daughter-in-law, they have uh, uh, between his, hers, and theirs, they have 11 children, uh, two, two and a half year old twins. And that is a challenge in and of itself, uh, just to have the energy to, to uh, go about it. But I mean, you can see the decline in, in moral decay. I, um, as valuable as devices and technology uh, are, those, uh, those have their own negative uh, side effects that uh, affect uh, families. Uh, uh, and it's not just 
children. I've got teenage grandchildren and they all come to visit grandma and grandpa, but they just sit there on the couch looking at their devices and, and uh, never really engaging. Uh, but I also see adults that are tied and tethered to their devices. And so there isn't the same kind of communication and intimacy, and I'm saying intimacy, emotional and spiritual, that uh, maybe we've had in past generations. I totally agree with everything that you said. One of my professors told me that the key to succeeding in school and succeeding in relationships and all this was to take my th phone and throw it away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I plead guilty on a lot of that. Uh, my wife has told me that uh, as I've gotten older, she thinks I'm a worse driver, but she says it's because I hear that beep on my phone and I've got to look at it. So every time she's in the car with me, she takes the phone or throws it in the back seat. And, uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's been lots of studies that show how, and I don't mean this in the mental health clinical way, but really how attention deficit disordered we all are. And, and we want to just get little bursts of information, little bursts of, of stimuli to our brain and to our psyche and our social life. And, uh, and, and I think that poses a real challenge for uh, serious in-depth learning as well. I totally agree with you there. And I, I do think that while we can't really pull, throw our phones away, there are a lot of things that we can do to spend less time on our phones and be able to build relationships with each other in a way that is more authentic than I think we're doing right now. Um, with that being said, how do you think families can stay together more and can cultivate better spiritual habits together? Well, that's been a, you know, that that was a challenge that, that I had as a young father and as, as Wendy and I tried to raise our children. Uh, and then in the research that I've done with Dr. Bruce Chadwick uh, through the years on, on families uh, rearing righteous youth in a wicked world uh, is one of the books that we did and, and studies that we've done with thousands of Latter-day Saint adolescents and, and parents that one of the things that we found, and I don't think it's any different in a pandemic world than, than maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and that is that you have to have carve out sacred space, sacred time. And, um, and if you just say, well, we're just gonna read the scriptures together, my children just kind of zoned out on that. And we would do it and we would go through scriptures. But if we would, if we would have time where we're together as a family, really talking about the issues and concerns and questions that they have, and then teaching the gospel in maybe a less formal way than 5.30 in the morning reading the Book of Mormon. Uh, I mean, there's a value with that, but uh, one of, I came up with a little phrase years ago as I did, uh, as Bruce Chadwick and I did workshops for parents around the church, and that is that it's not enough to get the, our children into the church. We have to get the gospel into them. And that's the same thing with family home evening, scripture study, family prayer. It's not enough to get our families into those religious activities, but find those ways where those religious activities become a part of, a part of them, get it into them. And, uh, and so trying to find sacred space, trying to have spiritual experiences in a loving environment, uh, I think that is critical. Uh, so let me give you an analogy. And uh, I'm probably not very good at anything, but I, I love to do a lot of things. And I love to garden. And one of the things that I've discovered through my years of gardening is that you can have the best seed, okay? Think where I'm going with this with the Alma metaphor. Uh, so you, you, you can have the very best seed, but if the soil is not warm enough, that seed is never gonna sprout. And the same principle I think applies in our homes that if we are like, like overseers and taskmasters and trying to pound the gospel into our kids in a cold, sterile environment, or maybe even a, uh, 
confrontive, contentious environment, the seed that Alma talks about will never ever sprout and spring up unto eternal life. And so when we speak of religious factors, you cannot separate out the religious factors from the affection and love and connection factors in a family. And so the more that I can develop a, a meaningful, loving relationship, the greater I will have spiritual influence in the lives of my children. And so while we do those religious practices, it really gains strength when it's coupled with the love, the affection, hugs, expressing praise and loving our children. So you can't really separate those out. And, and I think we, we are guilty if we, if we just love our children and never teach them the gospel and never engage in those religious practices, they don't get it either. And if all you do is read scriptures all Sunday long, but you don't really love your kids and they, aren't, they don't feel safe and protected and, and, and really adored by their parents, then that doesn't sink in either. That's more than you bargained for, but that's probably what my own children often say, oh, this is another one of dad's do as I wrote, not as he did principles. Uh, but I mean, I can joke about that, but I think anything that was successful to us in raising our children, and now as I watch my children raise their children in a trying to create a sanctuary of faith and a gospel-centered home, is that they they it requires consistent effort. Just stay after it, stay at it, um, recognize that it's never going to be perfect, but we're going to just keep trying to. Uh, love and bring the spirit in our home and repent when we don't. I love a lot of what you said there. And I think something that has been really important for me to kind of learn about is how you have to balance both learn, like loving your, loving your kids and teaching the gospel, because I do feel like we see them as antithetical. Sometimes we see, you know, having fun with your kids as being antithetical to the gospel, at least in I don't have kids, obviously, right? So I can't really speak that much about having kids. But I've seen I've seen a lot of parents talk about how they've tried to make everything gospel centered, but then they lose out on the aspects that kids are kids, kids need to have fun. And there's a way that you can do both that allows them to be able to experience childlike things, but also be able to experience the gospel. Absolutely. And I, that's, I think, I think that's, that's important. In, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues once said as we uh, we were making a presentation when the church was doing a great emphasis on on Sabbath day observance, and uh, and one of, he made a very interesting observation that I've loved and now I've I've stolen it and used it from him several times, and that is when it comes to Sabbath with our families, or you could broaden it to say trying to teach the gospel by precept and example in our families. If you're not enjoying doing it if you're not having fun doing it then you're doing it wrong and I think that's the point is that it my wife used to get after me when we would have early morning uh, scripture study with our kids and, and I would just I would just kind of want to get through as fast as we could that day and 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 Wendy would stop me once in a while and say well well dad aren't you going to teach him about that verse and I didn't ever say it, but I wanted to say, no, man, we don't have time to explain the scriptures. We just got to get going through them. And, and it was kind of like, well, what am I racing? What am I doing here? Is, are, is somebody going to take role at church to see how many verses we read? And, and I just think that I missed the point that, that I was viewing um, scripture study and family prayer and family home evening as an end in and of itself, when in reality, those should be means to a much deeper and broader end uh, in, our, in our overall family life. I really appreciate that. And I, I do think hindsight is 2020 with things like that. I think that everyone's gonna make the, the is gonna make some mistakes and is going to not be able to see things clearly, but it's a really great opportunity to share what we've learned to help other people improve. And with that being said, I'd like to talk a little bit about how 
come follow me plays into this. How do you think that come follow me can help families to have these experiences where they see the scriptures not as ends in themselves and they see family prayers not as an end, but a means to developing a relationship with Christ? Um, well, let me, let me respond to that um, by, by saying there's pre-pandemic come follow me and post-pandemic or during pandemic come follow me. And I would probably say when come follow me uh, and the approach uh, that it took in our gospel doctrines classes and our Sunday school classes, I, I, I will readily admit right up front, I was not a big fan. Uh, I felt like we were sacrificing depth uh, and breadth of scriptures for, for application of scriptures. And, and, I, and, and you've been in my classes, you know that application is important to me, but application and discussion without context and mm -hmm. without uh, background information is, uh, is probably not as impactful and effective increasing gospel scholarship. Little, little did I know at that time as we were introducing that, and I saw a lot of good things that were taking place in some homes, uh, but I, little did I know, and I would venture to say, little did anyone know except maybe prophets, seers, and revelators that Come Follow Me was going to be an incredibly important part of gospel teaching and learning in homes when the pandemic occurred. Uh, if we were to view just the church as the whole means of our gospel scholarship, then I would say that Come Follow Me is totally and completely inadequate. Uh, I would sit in Sunday school classes and they would, I, there would be all these discussions about their feelings, but nobody had ever, ever read the scriptures, read the scripture block. And so I could be frustrated, as one of my professors in graduate school once said, that sometimes gospel doctrine class is the rearrangement of ignorance. And, uh, you know, and I just think when, when, if we are sharing feelings and sharing experiences without any basis in the scriptures or the doctrines of the restoration, then sometimes we're re we are just rearranging and sharing ignorance. Now that being, I'm being critical and I may face the consequences for being so honest with you, Hannah, but, but I now can see that what happened when the pandemic hit and we weren't able to go to church, everything changes. And so now I have seen young families, my own uh, children and their families, um, when they had to take responsibility for the teaching of their children without primary, without young men and without young women and Sunday school, uh, I think that's where Come Follow Me became an incredible tool uh, and that no longer could a mom and dad just assume that their children were going to be taught the scriptures and taught the gospel at church. Now mm -hmm. it became a very important tool to help moms and dads uh, step up. And, uh, and, and I just have, I've just seen some incredible things during the last year as we have been in various stages of lockdown and various stages of church involvement. I have seen, uh, I've seen some incredible things taking place that has really changed my view of why we do come follow me. Um, I, I really see how uh, I, I used to, and in one of my books with Bruce Chadwick on parenting, uh, we, we had a, I, I remember we had a statement from a member of the 70, a longtime general authority named A. Theodore Tuttle. And he made a statement, and this was, he was probably gave it 30, 40 years ago, but he said, if you were, if you were solely responsible for your children's religious education and spiritual development, how would you do it? And what would you do? And I used to share that in, as we would teach workshops, just using it as a hypothetical. 
but now it is a reality. And that becomes, I think, very, very serious. And I have seen some very, very positive, but I've also seen some maybe, maybe not negative, but negligent side of the coin as well. I totally agree with a lot of what you said there. I had similar frustrations with Sunday school as well. Um, I would get pretty frustrated when I felt like people weren't engaging with the text. And I think it is fine to have feelings about scriptures. I think that's good. And I think we should acknowledge those. At the same time, I do think we are trying to find out what the scriptures say, not what we want them to say. Um, and I, I, I did see Come Follow Me as a good way to improve that, at least within my own YSA ward, where I, I've taught Sunday school and I've also taught Relief Society. And I've seen a difference in the way that people talk about scriptures nowadays than even two years ago, because I, I do think that this has been a good way for people to kind of take responsibility for their children's learning, for their own learning. And you're going to see some people not do that, and you're going to see some people do that. Um, but I think it's been really beneficial to become more responsible for it. This becomes a little bit harder, though, when you have young kids and teenagers how do you engage young kids and teenagers with Come Follow Me? Well, and that's a very good question because I don't even know how to engage college students very well, I guess. But <laughs> well, I thought you were I thought you were very engaging. I will say, so I took Brother Top's class. I took his eternal families class. I thought it was incredibly engaging, enough so that I, I continued to talk to him after I took the class. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. As I would say in, in class, that's worth a third of a point extra credit. There you go. So uh, the, the thing about it is what I find not very engaging during the pandemic environment is, um, is to just do zoom online lectures but not be on zoom uh, i i find my students uh, at byu when we are doing zoom classes they just kind of zone out and i've even noticed that where we have to wear masks in the class when i do blended learning that has seemed to stifle things a little bit and and so why i'm using that as an example is the worst thing we can do in a home is just plop them down and say, okay, now we're having class. Now we're going to do this. Okay, we are doing come follow me for the next three hours. Sit down, shut up, put your seatbelt on and do not even look cross-eyed at your little sister. You know, that, that, that just doesn't fly. And so uh, we always uh, in family home evenings, and I think come follow me, the same kind of thing is let's try to find some activities or games that can set the stage or be an attention grabber that then we can draw out of them and say, well, what did you feel about this? Or why did you, why do you think we did such and such or whatever? Um, there, there are so many resources available and I'm not just talking about the church resources and there are plenty of church resources, but I know that as I, I, I'm in Come Follow Me uh, Facebook groups, and I get pinged every time there's something that comes up. And, and of course, most of it maybe doesn't apply to my circumstance, but every single individual, single, every family, whether it be traditional, both parent family, uh, or single parent family or grandparent families. It doesn't matter what our background is, BYU religion professor, or only semi gospel literate because you may be a new convert or reactivated, but it doesn't matter. There are resources available. To me, the great value that came is that when moms and dads and others became solely responsible for the teaching of their little children and their teenagers, maybe necessity became the mother of invention and they went online scrambling to look for resources. And I think that's a pretty good thing. And, and then in my wife's and my case, 
I didn't have to go to Sunday school and complain about the lack of depth or breadth. Uh, I was now responsible for my own Sunday school class and my own wife's uh, as, as we would discuss things together. And it forced us to come up with the very things that we desperately wanted in our classes. And my wife and I, just as empty nesters, we had some of the best discussions from resources that we found on very important and I would say faithful uh, sites on the, on the internet. There are so many resources, no matter what your background. I, the, the negligent side of the coin that I mentioned earlier is I think some parents may be checked out when they didn't go to church. And they kind of have the attitude, well, if, the ch if I don't have to go to church, I'm not going to church. I hope that's a very, very small group, but I have seen some that maybe felt overwhelmed, maybe felt spiritually lazy, whatever. I don't know all the reasons, but I think there are some people that just flat out went on hiatus during the pandemic. Whereas on the other side of the coin, there are those that are doing more research and have been more diligent in teaching and studying than ever before. And, uh, and I know my wife and I, we have had better scripture study and discussions from Come Follow Me than we would have had had we just been sitting in a Sunday school class. I totally, I totally have had the same experience where I feel like because I was made accountable for what I had to learn, I then surrounded myself with people who were also accountable for what they wanted to learn and I had much better discussions than I had in Sunday school. And it has been a blessing in that way because I've been able to kind of get my friends who live in different places and been like, okay, we're, we're going to have our own little come follow me group. Um, just so that way we can, you know, be edified and we can learn what's important for us to learn too. Um, how can you cultivate spiritual experiences that are like going to church when you're at home? That's been a really hard thing for a lot of people. I have talked to a lot of people who have said not being at church has kind of made them feel a little bit lazy or made them feel like they they don't feel the spirit as strongly. So what are some ways that you think that you can kind of replicate those feelings at home? Well, uh, the one thing I would probably say, Hannah, is that uh, going to church isn't necessarily a spiritual experience. You see what I'm saying is yes. some people are going to experience that and, and uh, others. But let me just say, I think that Sister Top and I had probably the most spiritual sacrament meetings when it was just the two of us. And when I was authorized by our bishop to perform the sacramental ordinance for just the two of us. I think that uh, we didn't have talks in our sacrament meeting, but we talked in our sacrament meeting. And, and I think that is one of the differences is that um, maybe when we go back and, and my ward is kind of easing back into in-person church, but I know some parts it's, it's still different and ages they don't go and all that. But I think the idea is that I have to take full responsibility for spiritual experiences and my companionship with the Holy Ghost. And so it may mean that I can't go to a church building. I can't go to the temple as I used to do that. But I can read and ponder. I can pray. Uh, I, can, I can watch some church resources that I never, ever had time to do when I was so actively, anxiously engaged in church callings. Um, and so I would, I would say to my children, my students, my friends, your friends, just like you have taken responsibility for your own gospel learning, you've got to take personal accountability for your spiritual growth. And one of the ways that you would do that, uh, when I, 
uh, just an example. When I was called as a stake president uh, uh, several years ago, and uh, when the uh, 70 was training me and the area 70 that was companions with him and they were training me all these things. And uh, he shared with me a, a, a great experience that he had when he was called as a stake president by, uh, uh, by then Elder Faust. And Elder Faust uh, was uh, visiting with him and the stake pres newly called stake president said, uh, well, well, President Faust, what more have you got to say? How, how, what more training can you give me? And President Faust just pointed up to the sky and said, I can't train you, only he can train you. And, and President Nelson has emphasized to us to open the heavens to receive revelation. And it may very well be during this pandemic time when I may feel a spiritual lull in my life that I can't go to a come follow me site on the website and solve that, but I can go to the Lord and seek for him to teach me and to speak to me and help me to know how I can do that. Um, and, and I just think this, this terrible pandemic with all of its negative side effects in so many ways has opened the door for us to approach God and to have him open the heavens to us. And then maybe that's the answer is I can't say, here's how you can have spiritual experiences without Sunday school class. I don't think there is a, a recipe approach to it, but I know maybe I've been guilty of not taking that dilemma to the Lord more and finding it out for myself. I think what you said about taking it to the Lord and finding out for yourself is really important. I, so I was a temple worker right before uh, everything closed down and I had been working in the Provo City Center Temple for I think three years at that point. Mm -hmm. And once I had to stop, there was this big period of time that I now had opened because I had it scheduled. And I also have this white temple journal where I write down the names of everyone I've ever done temple work for as soon as I leave and I write down all the experiences that I have. And that takes a long time. And I was like, okay, so now I have eight hours of my week that I didn't have before. And at first I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna, you know, paint some flowers. I'm gonna do some yoga, <laughs> you know, and I was doing all sorts of things that, that are good to do, but not necessarily, you know, what I need to spend eight hours a week doing. Um, and I had a very strong impression to go through the entire, to go through the um, quad and write down every reference to Jesus. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that instead. And that filled up a lot more of my time. And I felt like that was one of the ways that I felt personally instructed. And I felt personally instructed in other ways to read talks by specific people and to study specific things that I just wouldn't have had the time to do. Um, to write specific things about the gospel too. I started writing a book during the pandemic because I just had so much more time that God was like, okay, here's what you're gonna do with your time. And I do feel like that's something that I think we could all do better. I see people talking all the time about how they have all, all this more time because you know, if you went to church somewhere that was further away, that includes a commute too, right? Because we still can do church things at, at home. But that includes a commute. So how you use that time and how you consecrate your week and you consecrate your Sabbath, I think is really important. What personal challenges have you had with you doing Come Follow Me each week? I know this is a hard question. Nobody likes to talk about how they, something might be challenging for them, but I'd love to hear how your challenges, what challenges you've had and how you've overcome them. Uh, okay, so let me, let me confess my sins. Um, when I was a state president, uh, one of the one of the blessings that I had as stake president is except when we had stake uh, or when we had ward conferences, uh, I rarely went to Sunday school. Uh, and and then when I was released as stake president after nine years and uh, and then I, I had to go to Sunday school and I told you already some of my kind of grumbling experiences about that. And then the pandemic hits and uh, we were expected to do it on our own. And my wife and I had these great 
discussions and in-depth studies. Uh, then, I, then when we were opened up again a little bit, I was called to be a gospel doctrine Sunday school class to teach Come Follow Me. And I wanted to say, no, I'm liking the way I'm doing it. Uh, but then I remembered something that my wife, Wendy, would often say to our missionaries when I was mission president, when she would say to them, it's not about you. And I think one of the roadblocks to me in getting the most out of Come Follow Me is that I have been selfishly wanting it to be all about me. And when in class or teachers or discussion are not meeting my needs, I grumble and complain and say, well, Come Follow Me is not working very well. And then I think, Top, it's not about you. It is about helping others to come to Christ and to come to know the scriptures in a little better way. And so maybe I need to quit grumbling about what I'm not getting out of it and start thinking about how can I share what I'm experiencing during this pandemic with others. Now, let me give you an example. This I'm, I'm certainly not an angel by any means, but we had some angelic opportunities. Uh, when we were finally able to have some, with masks and social distancing, uh, some social interaction with members of the church, I got permission to have the wife of a non-Latter-day Saint who didn't really want anything to, to do with the church, and the wife was a wonderful, faithful woman who I am her ministering brother. We invited her into our home. Those were the things that made it worthwhile when it was not just my studies and my filling my well, as much as I like to do that, as much as it was drawing upon that well to share with others both in formal and informal ways. And so I think that's, that's been a challenge when I maybe focus too much on myself. And one of the great rewards has been, well, Top, you've had 45 years as a religious educator. You better have something in the well that you can share with others. And that's when it has really become more rewarding and faithful. And we can do it in informal discussions. Uh, you know, I have the privilege of walking across the street to my ministering family that I can visit with, but just to talk, to post things on, uh, on social media, to uh, write a blog, whatever. There, those are ways whereby we strengthen the faith of others, which is really the principle of Come Follow Me on the sharing that I was resisting. I wanted to just turn on the the fire hydrant and let the knowledge flow when it really doesn't always work that way for everybody. Yeah, I had a similar challenge. Um, so I have one roommate um, and we have a cat, you know, and as you saw, I, the cat just came across the screen that, that tends to happen. I, when I started doing Come Follow Me, I really wanted to do it by myself. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of introverted and also I just had the attitude of you know I'm gonna get so much more out of it if I can sit there with all my books and I can you know try to track down all the historical references and try to understand the text and the context more fully and I did that for a while and it was edifying in a lot of ways but God kept telling me Hannah this isn't about you Hannah, you need to talk to other people, even if you're not going to be able to take all your commentaries with you. And once I stopped doing that, and then I started focusing on how I could use Come Follow Me as a way to love my neighbor more and to share more with my neighbor, I was able to have better experiences with it, even though I didn't feel like I learned as much. But I, I learned more character traits than I learned knowledge, if that makes sense. And I, I think oh, yeah. that that's one thing that we leave out of the equation. When we talk about learning things, what, what we're supposed to learn to do above all else is to love God and love our neighbor, right? So we can we need to acquire intelligence still. I'm definitely a fan of doing that. Um, but we also need to learn to cultivate those characteristics. With that being said, we're going to talk a little bit about this week's Come Follow Me. 
Um, well, now you're really going to put me on the spot. <laughs> Don't worry, I did give you forewarning. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Well, yeah, this week's Come Follow Me is pretty great. So it's Dr. and Covenants 18 to 19. I wanted to hear what stood out to you this week so far. Well, um, as I, I actually went uh, a couple of days ago as you gave me the heads up and I started uh, getting a head start and reading. And, and so what I have done and one of the ways that I approach Come Follow Me in my own personal studies is then I go to, uh, you know, revelations in context. I go to Steve Harper's book. I go to uh, the Joseph Smith papers uh, and, and read the, the revelations in that way. I try to get all of the background information that I can, but, and, and I, have, I have taught Doctrine and Covenants many times in my career as well, but the thing that jumps out at me again and again and again is that even though Martin Harris kind of takes a beating at times mm -hmm. and certainly is called to serious repentance, in this, that Martin Harris is an incredible uh, benefactor to the church, and in fact, maybe kept the church afloat during the difficult years. And so, uh, I look at I look at uh, Oliver Cowdery and and David Whitmer in section eighteen, and Martin Harris in section nineteen, but. It's easy for us to look at some of the blemishes in their spiritual record, so to speak. But it's also incredible to me to think of their experiences. Um, and even though they're called to repentance, they are called apostles in this revelation. They are called apostles as witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ with a special responsibility to go and find the first quorum of the 12 apostles. And so that to me always jumps out that I love in section 18, where they're given the three witnesses. And I have to tell you, I was a pretty seasoned religious educator before I finally figured out why in my priesthood line of authority are the three witnesses. Nobody had ever taught they, me that. And I thought, why in the world are those guys there? Every, it always lumped one person to the next person to the next person, and then three witnesses. And it dawns on me, I've been reading that revelation all those years and didn't realize they as apostles with the authority from Joseph Smith called all of the 12 apostles. And in that revelation, I find it fascinating that it's probably 1829 rather than 1830 is cited there. But just to think five to six years beforehand when they're given the assignment, but in section 18, the Lord speaks to those 12 apostles that haven't even been found and identified yet. That I think is great stuff in the, in the revelation there. That's really beautiful. I love that a lot. That was not what stood out to me, but since you told me that, I'm going to look into that a lot more. Well, that's I why I want you to tell me what stood out to you so I can say, yes. I hadn't thought of that, Hannah, but that's great. Now, now I'm being put on the spot. One thing that has stood out to me consistently also is Martin Harris, but something slightly different. So I was thinking about how last week we had the phrase marvelous work and wonder, right? Because that right. appeared four times, I believe. And then we have marvelous work appearing here I think twice um and one thing that I have been thinking a lot about is how Martin Harris despite having several issues um with Joseph Smith later on in his life never denied his testimony of the Book of Mormon um at the end of his life he bore a very strong testimony saying that the Book of Mormon is no faith I know what I know I have seen what I have seen and I have heard what I've heard I have seen the gold plates from which the Book of Mormon is written and to me, this kind of strengthens their call as apostles and also shows that Martin Harris had a very direct role in part of this marvelous work that I think we don't acknowledge enough that 
his role as a witness to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon was something that he never went back on, even though he might have had some issues with Joseph Smith and the church after that. But he had he had stayed true to the part of his work that he was assigned to do. And I, I think for me that that's, you know, that's really important to think about in our own lives with what we are asked to do. We're asked to repent and asked to come into Christ. And I really like that this section is a lot about repentance. And I, I also like that the Lord here is pretty direct when he says what happens to us if we don't repent. I do think for me personally, it can be a little bit tricky to not have very harsh language around repentance because it's not as motivating for me. Once I <laughs> once I see repentance as Oh, Hank Smith said the other day on Twitter, it, the choice is not to repent. Uh, the choice is not to repent or not to repent. The choice is to repent or suffer. Uh, once I see it in that way, I, I feel a lot more deeply about the way that the Lord works in my life, works in the lives of other people. But I think the theme of Martin Harris needing to repent time and time again, but staying true to his witness of the Book of Mormon is something that has been influential for me is there are a lot of times in my life where I need to repent where I'm doing things that are wrong and I'm sure that the Lord um, has similar feelings about me as uh, about me as he did about Martin Harris at times I'm sure that God you know says that I'm going to experience eternal damnation if I don't change who I am in a lot of ways. And for me, just seeing how the Lord was very persistent with Martin Harris and was very consistent with Martin Harris is influential, but also remembering that after all is said and done, Martin Harris did stay true to his witness. And that's something that I can do too. Yeah. In fact, uh, I think there's a, a building upon what you just said. I think there's another really beautiful concept there in section 19 when you understand the story of Martin Harris. Uh, when you think of the print run that is going to be for the Book of Mormons, it's really astronomical uh, by our standards. I mean, even the big publishing houses of New York uh, were not uh, publishing 5,000 copies in a print run, uh, you know, and here's this, uh, this fairly young man saying he's going to sell 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting that, uh, that Martin Harris is putting up all this money. He's mortgaging his farm. He's got his wife pounding on him, maybe literally, not just figuratively, because he's the one of the most prosperous businessmen in Palmyra, and he's being in her mind, hoodwinked by this charlatan, and he's mortgaging a farm and giving up all of their financial resources. And now, lo and behold, Martin Harris has already had his run-ins with the Lord about repentance on the 116 pages, and now he's thinking he's lost his soul, but now he's had the vision, and he has seen the angel and the plates and the other artifacts, he has had that witness, and yet there is still that element of concern. He goes to Joseph Smith and says, I've got to have a revelation, because even though he's seen an angel, even though he is one of the three witnesses, his money, his livelihood, his life is on the line. And it's okay to have those moments, even when we've had strong witnesses, even when we have strong knowledge of the gospel, there will always be those times that we will say, man, am I really, really all in and need that reassurance from the Lord. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things is that this once again, fulfills his, his, uh, his question, are you sure this is really going to work, Lord? And 
he gets that assurance. And, and though he gets chewed out a little, um, I, I just think it's a great message to me is that even with all of the witnesses that I have had and all of the great experiences and, that I've had through my life, when push comes to shove, when I have all those hard times, whether it's family issues or sickness or others, there are going to be those times where I just, my knees maybe buckle a little bit, but I have the assurance that the Lord's going to, uh, he's going to once again, let me know you're going in the right direction. Yeah, I have two thoughts to build off of that. The first one is, while you were talking, I was thinking about Elder Holland's BYU speech, cast not away, therefore thy confidence, exactly. where he talks about how right after Moses had seen God, then he has an experience with Satan. And then there's a passage in there that I really like that really captures a lot of what I think you were saying. Um, in an effort to continue his opposition, in his unfailing effort to get his lips in later, if not sooner, Lucifer appeared and shouted in equal portions of anger and petulance after God had revealed himself to the prophet saying, Moses, worship me. But Moses was not having it. He had just seen the real thing. And by comparison, this sort of performance was pretty dismal. I think with, you know, here where he had had revelatory experiences, but still had a little bit of reluctance, a little bit of doubt, that I think mirrors a lot of what we've seen Joseph Smith experience too, where Joseph Smith needed some level of reassurance after he had his visions where he was taught line upon line, precept upon precept. We see this pattern in the scriptures where prophets are given additional reassurance to help them center themselves in Christ. And I think about DNC 122, well, 121 and 122, where Joseph Smith, after having had so many revelations from the Lord, still asks God, you know, where are you? Why aren't you here? And when I think about the way that God speaks to me and the revelation that he gives to me. I see that sometimes after I've received a pretty strong witness of things, I sometimes have moments where I ask why, why can't I have another witness just to be sure? Um, because there is a lot on the line for us in a lot of different ways when we are trying to commit ourselves to Christ fully. Um, and I think here, the Lord's, the Lord's response to that is really interesting in a lot of senses because if we are to repent and if we are to develop that relationship with him through repentance i don't think we need the reassurance at reassurances as much which is i think why repentance here is the anchor to becoming more like god and then the second thought that i had uh, when you were saying that he had so much on the line i thought of verse five in dnc 19 Wherefore, I revoke not the judgments which I shall pass, but woe shall go forth, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, yea, to those who are found on my left hand. Obviously, those who are found on my left hand is referring to Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, where he talks about how those on the right are the ones who fed and fed the hungry, who gave drink to the thirsty, who took in strangers, etc. I think here we're seeing that there is this sort of Mm. symbolic hunger and thirst that Martin Harris is able to fulfill through the selling of his farm, right? Because that's what enables the printing of the Book of Mormon. That's what en en enables a good amount of the work to come forward. And that's answering the thirst and hunger of the righteous. And I think when the Lord is referring to Matthew 25, I think he's trying to expand Martin Harris's understanding of the impact of what his sacrifice would have because i don't think martin harris completely understood and i don't think we completely understand when the lord asks us to sacrifice things we we don't see very clearly how it plays out in our lives but i think in a very real way martin harris's sacrifice leads us to be able to hold a copy of the book of mormon in our hands today in fact uh, as you said that uh I like to use alliteration or, or having a word that, that, that the same letter for these three words because they become memory devices for me. And, and as you think of that, we have seen the process in Martin Harris that 
I like the first word that I use is convince. Mm -hmm. We get a witness of the spirit uh, that convinces us of something. But then as we continue to work and build upon those witnesses, we get the second C word, and that is we become converted. And so Martin has been convinced. He's in the process of conversion. But then the last C word that we all go through, and that is consecration. And so you go from being converted. There's no doubt in my mind that Martin still believes in Joseph Smith. Martin believes in angels and gold plates, and he is converted to the restoration of the gospel. But when the Lord asks him for all of his means, then it's that big next step. And all of us, consecration of all things is much, much harder than just raising our arm to the square. And that is really what Martin Harris goes through, but every single one of us are going to be asked to lay it on the line for the, for the building of the kingdom. And, uh, and I think you just see that. Uh, and Martin Harris, uh, uh, in so many ways, uh, uh, was consecrated, even with the, the other issues that led him out of the church for a, a period of time. Uh, you know, Hannah, one other thought that just popped into my head, too, is that, and it goes along with that process of convince, convert, and consecrate, and that is in, in Doctrine and Covenants section 18 in the revelation to uh, uh, the other two witnesses, David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery, so in addition to talking about apostles and all that, but there is another a beautiful passage that talks about how we hear the voice of the Lord. And uh, I, I, I thought of this, and you asked me about how do we do this with, with little children. But I remember many, many years ago when I was teaching seminary in Arizona, and I back in those days, we had cassette tapes. And I walked into class with a cassette tape, and, and I was so excited. And I said to the kids, I finally got it. I got it. I have the actual voice of Jesus Christ. It's been recorded. And, you know, first they kind of blew it off, said, oh, Top, you're full of it. And then I convinced them, I've got it. And then they, and I said, you want to hear it? Oh, yeah. I put it in the cassette player, and it is the scriptures on tape. And uh, and they were kind of freaking out, saying, oh, Brother Top, you oh, you lied to us. And, and yet the Lord is saying, when you read these revelations, when you read them to each other, when you read them to your family, you can testify that you have heard my voice. And I think that's some of the things we sometimes forget. Uh, I was giving a, a lecture many years ago and, and uh, I was talking about the power of the word and this very concept of section 18 of how we hear the voice of the Lord. And, uh, and I had some parents of a, of a Down syndrome adult child that said that when he got older, they decided, well, they weren't going to have family scripture study like they had with all of the other kids as they were growing up because they didn't think he was getting anything out of it. He wasn't as high functioning of, as others. And so they stopped and he came to him and said, please read the scriptures. I like the way they make me feel. And I think as you think about that, that we testify that we hear the voice of the Lord, but you can also testify that as we study the scriptures, as we study the revelations in all different angles, come follow me and everything in between, we can testify not only that we hear the voice of the Lord, but we feel the Lord's love and peace in our lives. And I certainly have had that experience many, many times in my life. Thank you for sharing that. That was very beautiful and very powerful. And I think that's too good for me to follow up. So I think we're going to conclude. But I want to know, where can we find your work? Uh, you've written some books. Where can we buy them? Uh, my, grandkids, my grandkids are always shocked when they go and Google me 
and say, <laughs> my grandpa is on Google or my grandpa's on Wikipedia. Uh, I think really the, uh, the LDS gospel scholarship things that uh, you can find uh, in, in Deseret Book or online or Amazon, uh, some of the, the more academic books that had to do with our studies on parents and youth uh, are uh, probably out of print. Uh, but if you go to the Religious Studies Center, the BYU Religious Studies Center website, and just search my name, virtually every article, every book that I have uh, ever written uh, through the Religious Studies Center on parents, families, scriptures, uh, you can find it free of charge. But if you want to buy my books through Deseret Book, go right ahead. Buy thousands of them. I don't mind. Awesome. Sounds good. <laughs> if you can buy a thousand of Brother Tom's books, please exactly. hand them out to everyone. Exactly. Give them as presents everywhere you go. Hey, yeah, just give them to just walk down the street and be like, happy, happy Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today, Brother Toff. I appreciated it. Oh, it's 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 fun, and I you know I can talk about the gospel all the time. I love you and love what you do, and it was an honor to be able to visit with you. Oh, thank you.